First, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is John Gale. I'm a neurophysiologist by training and have done clinical neurophysiology for approximately 30 years now. I'm vice president of Dixie Neurolab and the senior trainer for Dixie Medical US. Today, we're going to start the introduction to the brain because the goal is eventually we want to record single unit activities from individual neurons within the brain using Dixie products. Obviously, this is going to be a very condensed course. It's not going to be thorough. It's not meant to make everybody a physiologist. It's just to provide tools so that when you're out in the field that you have a grasp of the major concepts and also to help mitigate some of the noise issues which occur when we do single unit physiology. However, to understand the artifacts and what single unit activities look like, we have to learn a little bit about the brain. So we're going to go into brain, what the functions are. We're going to go into single unit activities and how they propagate electrical potentials. And then eventually we'll get down to some troubleshooting in later sessions uh, regarding artifacts. Okay, so when we look at the brain, essentially we have a bunch of sensory inputs. And they provide information in the brain. The brain does calculations and then does an output. And that output could be an arm movement. It could be the decision to walk across the room. The brain controls all these functions and it interfaces with the environment in more or less a linear fashion. And when I say linear, I mean an increase. Increased sound results in increased firing of neurons within the brain. A strong smell results in a bigger increase in activity in the brain. However, once the activity gets into the brain, it's calculated in a very complicated way. So that linear relationship disappears. And, and in fact, the calculations are done by very distributed neurons throughout the whole brain. And we're going to cover some of these topics. And just to go back to the basics, the brain does pretty much everything. It controls our autonomic and our neuroendocrine system. It's involved in our sensory perception, our motor output, our language, our ability to associate various environmental cues, and obviously learning. And that's learning of many different types. It could be learning to pick up a cup, for instance. So the brain is doing this constantly and all the time. And it's not segmented. It's con a continuous process. Really, the study of the brain, when the microscope was developed and particular staining techniques, and uh, we're going to see some of these images later, but Golgi staining and Cahol um, staining allowed us to actually discreetly identify units within our brain that had two distinct projections, one called the axon and the other one, the dendrite. And that these discrete units seem to be connected so that there was another discrete unit and then another one connected in kind of a chain way. The other thing is one neuron is connected to multiple neurons. For instance, in the striatum of our brain, there are 20,000 synapses on a single neuron receiving inputs from thousands of neurons at the same time. And this led to the kind of the, the idea that the, the brain is this large network of interconnected cells and that this is the fundamental communication within within nervous system. Essentially, the basis of what down here is called the neuronal doctrine. So this is this is a, a simple schematic of a neuron in yellow here. And we see some other cells around. We see these kind of uh, teal looking cells. These are glia cells in the in the brain, which help myelinate. And we're going to talk about what myelination is. But essentially, these are the two processes they talk about: the dendritic processes here. Here's the cell body, and then this long projection called the axon, which terminates in the synapse. And this is the essential organization of a neuron. They come in many different sizes. For instance, the dendrites can be here, and the cell body can be a projection sitting up here. There's many different ways in which neurons are organized. This is the quintessential view of a neuron. This kind of single unit organization led to a hypothesis called the cardinal cell hypothesis, which essentially, it's also known as the, the uh, mother cell hypothesis, which essentially says that each of these units store a particular memory. So there's, a, there's one neuron in your brain that stores all the information about your mother, there's another one that stores information about your father, and that's how the brain was organized. Each unit upheld one particular type of function. We know that's not true now. And in fact, thousands of neurons are involved in each of those associations. Montgomery probably said it best. He, there was an article he wrote on this in Brain Research. And when they were exploring this cardinal cell hypothesis, they would do various types of tasks. For instance, say the name Bill Clinton while they were recording from a single cell and the neuron fired and they're like, oh, that's the Bill Clinton cell. They would say Haley Berry 
and the, the original cell didn't fire, but a different one may have. And then eventually, you know, Britney Spears was found and so was Jennifer Aniston. However, as Montgomery says here, this is question begging. If you don't explore the brain using proper controls, what you wind up doing is answering the question you want and excluding all the other possibilities. For instance, the cell that responded to Britney Spears may respond to the, any name where the person has blonde hair. Another example, maybe when you say Bill Clinton, if you found might be related to hamburgers or cheeseburgers, as he liked hamburgers and cheeseburgers. So there might be a cell out there that if you, you know some, you said McDonald's and it would fire. So we need to be very careful when we explore the brain in terms of how we do our controls during experiments, but also the fact this gets rid of this leading hypothesis, which was called the cardinal cell hypothesis. Now we look at the brain as a fully functional integrated network. So let's get back to this basic cell. Uh, we're now going to get into how this cell works. And also in understanding how it works, it will tell you how single unit physiology works. What is unique about neurons is they have very dense collections of membrane proteins. And this is an example of what's called a sodium potassium pump. And what this pump does is it pumps using ATP, it pumps sodium out of the cell and potassium in. And interestingly, three sodium go out for every two potassium that come in. So what you wind up getting is a net gain of charge on the outside of the cell relative to the inside. This portion of the cell is the membrane. It's made of fats. So this keeps this separation of ions and as a result, a separation of charge. Now, there's different types of uh, membrane, uh, membrane spanning proteins that are sensitive to drugs or neurotransmitters, as you may call them. And what the neurotransmitter does is it binds here to some portion of this protein, allowing sodium or other ions to flow across that membrane. And when that happens, you get a charge change that can be measured as a movement on the electrical activity. You'll see a bump on the electrical activity. So what we can do is we can put an electrode down here. We can activate, in this case, it's a muscle cell, which operates very similar. And actually muscle cells were used to, to investigate a lot of neuroscience because of how they're activated. But essentially you activate the muscle and you can see a change in the current. If it's an activation, what you get is a positive change. If you put an inhibitory, you see it go down. What the organization of the brain, we have different types of receptors, some that allow negative charge to flow and some that allow positive charge to flow. That way we can inhibit the membrane or excite the membrane. Along with those other cells that we talked about, have, we have these voltage, voltage gated cells. And how these, these particular channels work in the neuron is when there's a voltage change that's a certain height, this channel will open, allowing sodiums to flow in. So now the interior becomes more positive than the exterior. If enough of these open, we generate what's called an action potential. With the neurotransmitters, there's small little changes in activity. So on this particular slide, we're talking about how small little electrical events that occur on the ligand gated channels of the dendrite can summate together to, to cause what's called an action potential. They can summate in different ways. So spatially, if you get a lot of little small inputs all throughout the dendrites at the same time, the electrical activity will travel together and then get down here and the small little activities will summate together and go over a certain voltage, allowing the sodium voltage gated sodium channels to open. If that summation is large enough and a large enough number of sodium channels open and action potentials generated that will traverse this whole axon down to the synapses. And that's an all or nothing event. So once the action potential starts, it propagates. Another concept here is temporal summation. So instead of having a whole bunch of small activations occurring around, we can imagine a repetitive activation happening here that summates together causing an action potential. So two different processes, temporal and spatial. And we in, in fact employ this with electrical stimulation to cause neurons to fire. We can activate a large enough population of membrane 
or we can stimulate repetitively. Either one can cause a summation of an action potential that will propagate this uh, length of the neuron. Okay, this is just another example of a voltage gated channel. These are located all along the cell, but very high densities in the axon hillock here. And then at the nodes of Ranvier, which are membrane segments between myelination or fat that's surrounding the axon. This fat that surrounds the axon acts more or less like an insulator around a wire. So the activity, the action potentials are moving and they're moving quite fast along this membrane. But when they hit this insulator, they jump very quickly between the nodes down the length of the neuron. And in fact, this process of jumping from node to node is called saltatory conduction. And if we look at different types of neurons in the brain, the larger the diameter of the axon, the faster the action potential moves, and the more myelination that a neuron has, the faster the action potential moves. And the nervous system has designed itself to utilize these different speeds for various functions. So let's get back to this process here. We have a neuron. A sufficient number of excitatory potentials occur in the cell body area. They'll propagate to the axon hillock, generate an action potential. That potential will go down the axon to the synapses. And at the synaptic level, they will release neurotransmitters to a subsequent neuron. And what we find is these transmitters can be excitatory or inhibitory. So the action potential traveling down here can cause these cells that it's attached to to either fire less or potentially fire more. So this is how the basic structure of the brain, one neuron connected to multiple neurons, and then those neurons then transmit to further neurons. Everybody knows a, a simple reflex arch. In this case, what you have is a piece of skin, you stick a needle in it, it activates this neuron here, which then goes into the spinal cord. There's an inhibitory synapse that then allows this neuron to be inhibited, which then makes this, this axon activate it, and then you move your muscle. So we have what are called simple reflexes, where it's just a couple neurons in a chain. They occur very quickly. Doesn't require the brain to process its information. And this is spinal cord activity. You know, obviously, if you put your hand on a plate, you don't want that information to go up to your brain to be calculated and output because that takes time then to tell you to move your hand off the plate. So we have these simple reflexes and there's various examples of different types of reflexes that we have. And then the brain processing. The brain processing are more complicated movements or thoughts, and they take a while so that when the input comes in, there's actually a time delay between that input being received, being calculated, and then an appropriate behavior being generated. More or less, the brain is now being described as a functionally parallel segregated networks. And when we say that they're parallel networks in how they're organized, they're partially separated so that motor is separated from cognition, which is separated from visual processing. But there's a very similar organization to how the brain is organized. And we tend to think of these as loops now. And these segregated loops are segregated, but they do cross information. Also, this organization allows the brain to be highly parallel. And we've all heard of parallel processing on computers, but what do we essentially mean? Well, the brain's able to do multiple things at a time in different parts of the brain. However, the timing of everything is, is done in such a way that it appears like it's a single process. For instance, if I show you a blue block, one part of the brain is encoding what the block shape is, another part's encoding the color. Yet, we don't see them as blue and block, we see it as a blue block. And this is what we mean by parallel organization. To us, it seems a single unit rather than distinctly segregated units. So here's an example of parallel loops. So this is the motor loops. Ocular motor, this is eye control. Prefrontal loops, this is more emotion and so forth. And then limbic. So limbic is really your emotional center. The prefrontal is involved in emotion, but it's more, uh, more or less your higher functioning area. But the way the brain is organized, we have the cortical areas, which are up here. And the cortical areas are the surface of your brain. Each of these areas then have a striatum, which is here located in different parts of the brain. The anterior caudate is very forward, for instance. The caudate is slightly in back of it. The putamen is slightly in back of that. And then each of these loops also have a palatal region. There's 
different types, different areas of the pallidum. There's the anterior, posterior regions of the pallidum. And then each area projects to its own unique part of the thalamus, which then loops around and innervates the cortex again. So they're all in this kind of loop structure and use common anatomical structures, but they're organized in different places. So that when we go into the brain, we can record from motor areas, which are distinct, that respond primarily to motor function. And yet we can record in separate areas to look at prefrontal function. And by doing recordings there, we can actually isolate the right part of the brain to do surgery in. We also can think about how drugs affect these different loops and how we have motor issues. For instance, in Parkinson's, how do we treat this loop separately from this loop? So this is basically how we look at the brain now in these parallel loop structures. However, when we think about them in parallel loop, I describe activity going from cortex to putamen to pallidum out to thalamus in a very sequential fashion. Unfortunately, that's not how the brain operates. In fact, all these areas are firing at the same time. They're not in a sequential process. If I did it sequentially, this is an example in Parkinson's disease. We lose these cells here, these dopamine cells, which then cause a lack of inhibition on these D2 cells of the striatum. So they increase their activity. GPE decreases its activity. SDN increases it. GPI increases it, thalamus is decreased, so the cortex is decreased in activity. So this is a very sequential process. And in fact, it's more like a Rube Goldberg model. So the best way to drink your suit is not to go through a complicated system of gadgets moving around to pull your arm up to bring the suit to your mouth. The brain operates in an ongoing fashion, and the information that controls your arm movement is an amalgam of all those activities occurring at one time. They're not sequential. So the brain is active essentially throughout these loops. And the sequential processing, although it makes it easier to maybe understand the brain, it's not how the brain works. So when we study the brain, most of what we did in the past was all observational. We had an accident. The patient had a hemorrhage, a blunt trauma to the head. And we, we saw it affect at one particular part of the brain. And then we would look to see how it changed that patient's behavior. There may be a disease such as Parkinson's or MS, stroke or tumor, and that will change the functions of these loops in a particular way. And we would study how that affected their behavior. Then finally, we had post-surgical complications. So we would go in and just and do a surgery maybe to save the patient's life, but when they woke up, they didn't have memory, for instance. So we would start to understand what these different parts of the brain uh, actually, how they played a role in, in function. So I'm going to go through some of the more notorious examples. This is uh, Phineas Gage. His job prior to an accident was to actually pound dynamite down holes so when they when they explode at the dynamite, it would break rock up so they could, so they could lay rails lines. However, one day when he was jamming this metal pipe down on the on the dynamite, it actually ignited the dynamite and blew the rod through his head. And this is an example of what it looked like. So they take him to the hospital, they take it out, and wow, he lived and he, he seemed not to lose a lot of function. He lost vision in this eye. He healed up, he went back to work, but he was different when he went back. He Before this, he was a hard worker, always on time, getting any fights. And after he returned, he actually was late for work. He started to drink and began to fight everybody around him. That's because this rod went through his frontal cortex, his control. And we hear about people that have damage now to the frontal cortex and lose their ability to restrain their behavior, and they engage in behaviors which are not necessarily the best. Another notorious example is HM, or that's how I knew him in neuroscience for many, many years, and that's because he was still alive, and he was in many, many research projects because he had an unexpected outcome following a surgery. We now know his full name because he has passed on, and his brain is still being analyzed for the reasons why he had his deficits. Now, Henry had epilepsy and they had identified that the hippocampuses, which are normally these yellow circles, looked abnormal. And the surgical decision was to go in and remove both of his hippocampus. However, what happened was he woke up and had lost the ability to form long-term associations. Now we know we cannot remove both hippocampus. And there's also a dominant hippocampus when it comes to learning. 
So we're very careful now when we see damage to the hippocampus with epilepsy and resecting only one and only if it's not the dominant learning side of the brain. So this is another example how accident uh, actually led to more understanding of neuroscience. What's interesting now, we have other techniques instead of just doing, you know, imaging and, and some recordings, we can actually go into the brain and put grids on them and monitor for epilepsy. And in this case, what we found was the epileptic activity was occurring around this contact 45. However, right next to that contact was motor function. And you can see there's a very distinct line here that wasn't crossed during this resection. So this part of the brain was removed. This is a cotton ball filling the space till they're ready to close. But you can see a distinct line here. Now we use electrophysiology to discern these boundaries. The other ways we can understand the brain is through experimental physiology, behavior, anatomy, pharmacology, and electrophysiology. The purpose of today is to talk about recording single neurons in humans. However, the access to record from the human brain has more or less come along with the beginning of deep brain stimulation surgeries back in the 90s. We're not allowed to open people's heads and put electrodes in to understand human function. So most of the experimental work that we did was in animals. That is now changing. With SEG, we're placing electrodes for the patient care throughout many structures of the brain. And with single unit recording, we're able to do experiments in humans now that we could only envision doing in animals. Here's an example. This particular monkey I used in my dissertation. And this is two different sides of the brain. I've used the stain here that stains dopamine neurons pink. And this area here is what's called the substantia nigris pars compactus. This has a lot of dopamine in it. This is involved primarily in motor function. And then what it called the ventral tegmental area also contains dopamine. And the ventral tegmental area is involved in other functions like learning and cognition and various other types of behaviors. However, with Parkinson's disease, we see a die-off of the neurons. And in fact, 85% of them have died by the time you're diagnosed with Parkinson's. However, a number of years ago, there was an accidental finding of a drug that kills these cells. And in fact, I injected the drug on one side of the animal's brain. And you see what happens when the drug is injected on one side of the brain. It's almost a, a complete die-off of the compactus. And then the other side of the brain, because it hasn't seen that drug, remains normal. And what we would do then is do behavioral studies in these animals and a physiology to try to understand how Parkinson's altered the function of the motor loops and non-motor loops in these animals. With the advent of deep brain stimulation, however, we were now recording inside these various nuclei of the brain in human patients. This is an artificial Parkinson's. A Parkinson's patient has real Parkinson's. So learning about real Parkinson's is very exciting and an opportunity that you just wouldn't have in an animal model where you're artificially doing it. This all comes to the Dixie MME, which I have a picture of up here. These are the connection cables. One side connects the single unit contacts. The other side connects the macro. We have a small micro drive. This essentially is put into the brain like a normal SEG electrode. The screw holds the cap in. And we have a number of macro contacts along the shaft. And then there are different types, but all the different types, the micro wires can be deployed from between contacts one and two. And on these micro wires are very, very fine wires. Each one of these, these extensions have four very, very small wires on the order of 15.9 microns in diameter. The total diameter of the, of the whole wire is about 80 microns with the insulator. So what do these allow us to do? We can record macro activity that we normally record. And we record now on these smaller contacts, individual neurons. And this diagram here really gives you a look at this. So the macro contacts are doing millimeter scale recordings of local field potentials. You can see the individual neurons, some of everything, including the dendrite activities, the axon activities, and the synaptic activities. On the micro wires, you can also record field potentials. And they kind of look like this. And they give you smaller resolution. Now you're recording on the micrometer scale a number of individual cells rather than thousands of cells at the macro level. And if we filter the data correctly on the micro contacts, we can now see individual neurons firing. And that those would be these sharp inflections 
down here. As I said, there were four wires on each bundle and we could see they're seeing different activities. This neuron is not seen in this channel. This spike is seen up here and the organization of this electrode or what we call a tetrode does is it puts the microwires around the population of neurons. And the closer each wire is to a particular neuron, the higher an activity it will see. So for instance, if we go up here, this is a single channel wire. We're recording one neuron of low amplitude and another one of high amplitude. So what this tells you is you're closer to this neuron than you are this neuron. And because we have four of them, we could take advantage to help us separate out the individual neurons. Because if it's not, if it's seen on two channels, that means the neuron is closer to these two channels than in the middle two. The fact that we have four contacts of a certain type of electrode allows us to see single unit and to help us sort or separate the neurons into individual spiking activities. And that ends session one.